Did our ancient ancestors have access to technologies that we no longer have access to today? Were they capable of doing things that we can't? The idea might sound laughable, but how else would you explain some of the things you're about to see in this video? The evidence will show that people who lived thousands of years ago had incredible resources available to them, and you'll be left wondering whether the inventiveness of the human race has deteriorated over time. The most obvious place to look for evidence of ancient technology is Peru. We'll look at specific Peruvian examples later on in this video. But for now, let's talk about ancient Peruvian architecture in general. Nobody knows who lived here before the Inca, but whoever they were, they had incredible masonry skills. Their monuments show that they were able to cut and shape andesite stone without leaving tool marks on the rock, and they could also drill perfectly circular holes in the stone without using tube drills. That shouldn't be possible, and we have no idea how they went about the task. The massive megalithic blocks that make up the Inca walls of Olentetambo weren't made by the Inca. They were recycled from the ruins of the Sun Temple, built by unknown hands many centuries earlier. As far as we're aware, the people of this era didn't have any metal tools, or even the knowledge of how to make metal, and yet their techniques were advanced enough to cut through granite as if it were butter. This doesn't make sense in the context of our established knowledge, and so our established knowledge must be wrong. We promised to look at more specific examples, and so we shall. This is the Kilarumi Yoke archaeological site, not far from the Peruvian city of Cusco. It isn't far from the world-famous tourist site of Machu Picchu, so it often gets overlooked by visitors. That's a shame, because there's something wonderful and unexplained here. It's this cluster of strange shapes carved into the rock, again using tools or methods that left no traces or identifying marks on the rock. It's as if someone reached into the rock and shaped it with no more care or difficulty than if it were a piece of clay. The purpose of the shapes is unknown, but there's been some speculation that it might be a solar or lunar calendar of some kind. That might explain its name. If we break it down, the kila means moon, umi means rock, and yok means here. It's a crude translation, but it all comes together as place of the moon rock. There are no depictions of the moon on the rock itself, so it seems likely that the rock was instead used to somehow track the movements of the moon. These ancient people were as accomplished with astronomy as they were with construction. The problem with stone monoliths is that people take them for granted. They stand in the same place for such a long time and look so unremarkable that they become part of the landscape, and people stop asking who put them there or why. Here's a stone monolith standing on a ridge called Gardam's Edge in England's Peak District National Park. It's been here for at least 4,000 years, but it didn't get here by itself it may not even have ended up in this distinctive shape on its own. The monolith is vaguely triangular, with a flat face that might have served a practical purpose. It angles to the geographic south and is aligned with the precise altitude of the sun at midsummer. Based on this, a study of the monolith that was carried out in 2012 concluded that it was placed here by Neolithic people as an astronomical marker. There are even packing stones at the base of the eight-foot-tall artifact to prevent it from slipping or toppling over. The flat side of the stone would remain in shadow for the entire winter, but been illuminated during summer. It's not quite a calendar, but it's a way of tracking the seasons and the passing of time. Tiwanaku in Bolivia is a world-famous archaeological site, but it's also an imperfect one. Much of the site is ruined and decades of testing, analysis, and footfall has inadvertently damaged or destroyed historical provenance and evidence. That's a tragedy, because if we're ever going to get to the bottom of the secrets of the Incas, this is where we'll do it. After all, Tiwanaku is the place they thought the rest of the world was created from. The damage is so bad that none of the remaining 150 blocks of Pumapunku are still in their original state but our modern technology might be able to solve that. 
A research group from UC Berkeley, USA is currently scanning the site and using the gathered information to create 3D scans of the entire area. Through this, they can digitally move stones back to their original positions and fill in the blanks with buildings that are no longer there. Seeing the site as it would have looked 1,500 years ago or more, they can then print 3D models of their recreated sites, allowing archaeologists to explore with their hands as well as their eyes, but avoiding further damage to the real stones. Through this method, the technology of the present might lead us to the secrets of the technology of the past. Speaking of computers, it seems inconceivable that anybody could have made the Saihuite monolith in Peru without one. There are over 200 individual designs carved into the monolith's surface, and most archaeologists and historians can't make head nor tail of them. Many have come to Abenque to look at the artifact with their own eyes, but all have returned home defeated. They can't even be sure when the monolith was carved, although it's likely to have happened somewhere between the 15th and 16th centuries. That would make it an Inca relic, but what did the Inca mean by creating it? It's covered in animal shapes, but also in lines and curves that have been interpreted by some as canals or roads. There even appear to be residential dwellings here and there, along with temples. There's so much detail that some fringe historians believe that the Saihute monolith is a topographic model of the surrounding area that was used by the Inca to test the viability of artificial canals. They'd pour water onto the monolith, watch how the water behaved, and then replicate it in the land around them if they liked what they saw. If the theory is correct, then this is 15th century town and irrigation planning on an almost unthinkable scale. Medicine and surgery are ever-advancing fields of science. What's considering cutting-edge today will no doubt be thought of as primitive 200 years from now. There are some kinds of surgery, though, that we'd assume to be far too dangerous and advanced for our ancient ancestors. Brain surgery is probably the most obvious one. It might, therefore, surprise you to hear that people were carrying out rudimentary head, skull, and brain surgery in Northern Africa 7,000 years ago. Evidence of the practice was discovered in February 2019 in Omdurman, Sudan, when archaeologists recovered a human skull with a hole drilled in the back. This is a process called trepanation, which is designed to reduce pressure on the brain. It sounds barbaric, but it can be surprisingly effective. The other surprising thing about the skull was that it belonged to someone who was around 65 years old when they died. An extremely long life for a man of that era. Was he typical of his people? Did he live among a group who outlived all of their neighbors because of their comparatively advanced medical knowledge? We need to know more. The stone circles of Odry in Poland might not look as impressive as the far more famous stone circle of Stonehenge in England, but they're arguably more mysterious. That's not just because they're hidden inside a thick forest full of myths about magic and witchcraft. They date back to the first century which puts them in the Iron Age and suggests that they might be the work of the Goths. There are 12 stone circles at the site, each with a stela at the center. Buried between the circles are between six and 900 people in barrows. The positioning of the stones is curious. They don't align with the stars, and nor do they point in any significant direction. You can't use them to mark the solstice or the equinox. To put it another way, they don't correspond with the purposes we normally expect to see in ancient stone circles. There might be hope on the horizon for solving this mystery, though. A recent satellite and ground-penetrating radar survey of the area has revealed the presence of even more circles overlapping the existing ones, but they can't be seen with the naked eye. Perhaps reconstructing the whole site is the key to understanding it. The stone circles of Odri might not have been used to watch the stars, but Kokino Observatory in North Macedonia was. Despite being 3,800 years old, a time we associate with superstition and fear, the observatory contains markers 
that can still be used to watch the movement of the sun and the moon through the sky. From that data, it would be possible to create a lunar calendar. That's precisely what we think the observatory was built for. When the Bronze Age structures were discovered in 2001, archaeologists initially thought they'd found the ruins of a settlement. Only by studying the positioning of groups of stones and tracking them up the sides of a mountain did they realize that the whole site is effectively one large ancient megalithic stargazing facility. At the heart of the site is a pair of platforms standing 62 feet tall, from where a person or people could survey all of the stones and make observations. There are even four stone thrones here, implying that perhaps this society's rulers came to watch their astronomers at work. We're frequently told that the people of 3,800 years ago were little more than barbarians, but it's so obviously not the case. No ancient civilization has been studied more than the Egyptians, and yet there are still new things to find out about this mighty race and its empire. We don't even fully understand some of the things we've found already, like the Temple of Kam Ambo. The mummified remains of several hundred crocodiles were recently found underneath the temple, thus finally explaining some of the markings on the walls. Unusually for Ptolemaic period Egypt, the temple is divided into two. We have two halls, two courts, two sanctuaries, and even two entrances. Half of the temple is devoted to worshipping Sobek, and the other half to Horus. The Sobek half of the temple is covered in crocodile paintings, but nobody could ever work out why. The paintings earned the temple the nickname House of the Crocodiles, but until the crocodile remains were found, most historians just thought of the artwork as quirky and unexplained. What remains unexplained are the engravings of medical and surgical implements on the temple walls, which are said to be the oldest in the world. Were there two separate priesthoods here? Was one devoted to medicine and the other to crocodiles? If so, what did they have in common? All of us have a piece of technology that's carried on working far longer than we expected it to. It might be a video games console, or a phone, or perhaps a laptop, or something as simple as a watch. However long it's kept ticking for, it's got nothing on Iran's Nashtifan windmills. They've constantly been working for over a thousand years, and they still grind flour today. At the risk of stating the obvious, these are the world's oldest working windmills. They don't look much like windmills, though. And that's because they come from a time before the conventional design for windmills was invented. There are no sails here. Instead, we have slats covered in clay and straw and set into the walls. There, they get battered by the strong winds that constantly hammer Nashtifan. The wind turns the slats, the slats power the ancient grindstones, and flour is produced. The precise secrets of how the mill works are never written down and instead are passed verbally in a line of succession from father to son. Here in 2021, the mill's current operator has no son, and the future of this ancient mill is unclear. We only left Egypt a moment ago, but let's go back there to check out the country's unique egg ovens. The Egyptian way of incubating eggs was perfected 2,000 years ago and has never changed since. The design might look simple, but an average Egyptian egg oven can contain up to 4,000 eggs at any one time. That's a lot of chickens! In essence, these are little more than mud ovens, but they're precision engineered to build and retain temperature at a certain heat, never going above it. Nobody other than someone who owns an egg oven knows how. The poultry farmers of Europe 2,000 years ago would have killed for technology like this, but they were nowhere near it at the time. In rural parts of Egypt, the ovens are still used today, and the secrets of their construction are still jealously guarded. Ask someone how they went about the task of building theirs, and they'll smile at you and shake their head before retiring to their rest chamber somewhere deep inside the oven network. That's how big these things are! We feel like we haven't given enough attention to the wonders of ancient Greek technology in this video, 
so let's do something about that. If you want to know about Greek ingenuity and Greek world firsts, go to the Katsanas Museum of Ancient Greek Technology in Karakolo, Greece. It effectively contains all the technical wonders of the ancient Greek world gathered together in one place. Here, you'll find out how the world's first robot served people wine more than 2,000 years ago, and that the robot was thought of as little more than an amusement at parties. Find out how Archimedes took time out from coming up with incredible inventions to design puzzles purely for his own amusement. Did you know, for example, that the tic-tac-toe mechanic that powers modern online slots was developed in Greece? The museum will attempt to make the case that the technology that was used by the ancient Greeks laid the foundation for the technologies we use today far more than the technology of the Romans, the Egyptians, the Chinese, the Inca, or anybody else. By the time you leave the museum, you might even find yourself agreeing with that perspective. Subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, and enjoy watching new videos on my channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon!